Luke 16. Money, 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 money. It's all that it seems to be discussed anymore. Not really, but it's a big deal. As a kid, I was told, anybody else been told this when you were a kid? Don't talk about money. <laughs> no, you weren't told that? No, I don't remember. So here's what happened to me. Here's what happened to me. I was, uh, I think it was around Christmas time, and I was a young kid. Don't remember how old, but I remember asking my uncle very frankly, how much money do you make? And my mom was like, don't ask that question. I'm like, what's the problem? Like, why? I, I didn't understand uh, what she was so mad about. And my uncle seemed offended too. Like, what? How could you ask that? How much money do I make? You know, that's none of your business or whatever. And I'm like, uh, I, I thought, well, that's strange. Why? I mean, we go to the store. Things cost money. We pay for we pay for food. We pay for things that cost money. Why is it so inappropriate to talk about money? It seemed like a forbidden topic to discuss, and it was a ridiculous thing to say that to a child. You know, I thought it was ridiculous then. I still think it's ridiculous now. Here's a crazy statistic: thirty-three percent, one third approximately, of Jesus's parables about the kingdom of God use money as an illustration of eternal truths. 33, one out of three parables Jesus elected to discuss money to, to show us the kingdom of God. If we don't have a proper biblical understanding of money, we do ourselves and the next generation a great disservice. I wish my dad or my mom or some adults would have sat me down and helped me understand money. Because after that conversation, things just went downhill. When I was 18 years old, I went into Canadian Tire just down the street. I remember walking in and, you know, they, I don't know if they still had this, but they have the person at their front. They're like, hello, sir. Um, would you like to hear our offer? And I'm like, sure. I'm 18. You know, no job. Let me hear what you got for me. Because, oh, we got this Canadian Tire MasterCard. And then when you use it, you get Canadian Tire points. And you can use it to buy things here and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, okay, sounds like a good deal, right? Free money. <laughs> so I signed the thing. And there was a spot there that said annual income. Okay. The fact of the matter was my annual income was zero dollars and zero cents. <laughs> but I didn't put that. I put 20000 <laughs> And that was it. I thought, surely I won't get a car. Surely they're not stupid enough to give an 18 year old with $20,000 a year salary. Uh, uh, well, a couple weeks later, there it was in the mail. A thousand dollar limit. How long do you think that lasted? Not very long. Less than a month. Less than a month. And you know what I bought with that, that money? Supplements. Protein powder, creatine powder. I literally blew the whole... I maxed out the credit card on workout supplements. Did they increase your limit? Uh, they did. They did. Eventually, it got up to like 3000 I think. Um, why did I do such a stupid thing? Why? Because I was never taught about money. Not I could blame my parents. It wasn't their fault. I was 18. I should have known better. But I just didn't know... About money. I didn't know the truth about money. And it was a huge uh, hindrance to me. Did you get allowance? Allowance? No, I never got an allowance. No. I didn't do anything to deserve an allowance. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, even if they, were, my parents offered me one, I didn't deserve it. So when it comes to Christians, I, see, I, I feel there's two extremes. I've noticed two extremes. One, you're either a prosperity Christian, right? Who thinks that uh, all believers should be rich drive uh expensive cars and have nice homes or you're a poverty-minded christian and you think that even having the thought of financial prosperity is a heresy is wrong and i've met both types but the truth as usual is somewhere in the middle both extremes are wrong okay jesus didn't come to make you rich to drive a bugatti jesus also didn't come for you to be broke poor the Apostle John, as I prayed earlier, wishes the church to be prosperous in health, 
and in wealth, even as their spirit prospers. So it's not prosperity, financial, or your health, or otherwise, that's the problem. The problem is, who are you serving? That's the question. You, the, the, Jesus tells us you cannot serve God and money. You cannot worship God and money. And so Jesus tells us a parable, as he often does, to cement this truth in our minds. And you know how he does it? He does it by once again aiming his divine arrows at the Pharisees and using them as, a, uh, as his target practice to help us to see and realize the truth not only about money, but about the kingdom of God. So, um, Luke 16 and verse 1. He also said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. This parable is one of the hardest I've ever had to interpret. I spent years, I'm not exaggerating, years trying to figure out what is this parable saying? As you'll see later, it gets very strange. So this parable comes directly after the prodigal son or the parable of the two sons, as I like to say. So it's important to remember that the context remains the same as it did last week with the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the two sons was directed at the Pharisees, and so is this parable. Now, verse 1 says Jesus said this to his disciples, but as we'll see as we continue on, um, the Pharisees react uh, very strongly, and it's obvious at that point that Jesus was speaking to them and about them. So, as often happens when authority becomes centralized within a group of men, you know what happens, right? They become corrupt. <laughs> What happened with the Pharisees is they became an elitist religious inner circle and they were running, like we talked about last week, they were running a purity racket um, and, of course, they found a way to make a lot of money in the process. So Jesus tells them a parable and in the story there's a rich man and a manager. And just like today... Rich people in the ancient world had managers. They had so much money, so many treasures, so much riches. They needed someone to help manage it. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So in the course of time, what happened? Charges were brought to the manager. Someone says, hey, it appears, or charges were brought about the manager to the rich man. So it appears somebody saw into the accounts and said, something's not right here. Now, the manager, we're told, was a dishonest man. And sooner or later, right, his dishonesty caught up to him. His shenanigans caught up to him. And the word spread. He was running a scam, being scammy. Anybody ever met a scammer before? No, you have. They've called you several times, I'm sure, to try to sell you a duct cleaning or something of the like. Take me off the list, please. Or a Chinese lady talking in your ear. Oh, what is that? Yeah, oh, you want a vacation. I had one yesterday. It was a robot telling me that the IRS is coming for me. It's like, uh, excuse me, robot, that's out of your jurisdiction. For... But anyways, charges were brought against the scammer that he was wasting possessions. He was wasting his master's possessions. And it wasn't that the manager, it's not that he was just being reckless uh, just flushing money down the toilet. That's not what the Greek word used here is 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 describing. The word here is, now here's, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this word, uh, diaskoriz, no, diaskorpizo. Okay, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows that word, diaskorpizo. <laughs> it's, uh, it's where we get our English word dispersion, dispersion. And, and a specific word from uh, diaskorpizo is diaspora which refers to, if you guys know what the diaspora is, it refers to when the Jews were scattered among the Gentiles um, after their captivity. So essentially, he was dispersing the money. He was, the money was going into a di diaspora. It was being dispersed in a way that was wasteful. And, and, and a, this is what we need to understand. It wasn't wasteful for the manager, okay? It's not that he was dispersing the money and wasting it and 
and not getting a, a benefit. It was wasteful for the rich man, sure, but not for the manager. So the rich man hears these charges. He calls in the manager. He says, hey, what am I hearing about you? I got people coming to me saying, you're being reckless. You're wasting my possessions. You're dispersing them. What is this I hear about you? Bring me the accounts, the final accounts of my wealth that I've given you oversight of. You're fired. So what's happening here. He is fired. You can no longer be manager. The manager thought he could get away with serving his master and his insatiable appetite for greed and unlawful gain. But he could not. I remember a guy I used to work with at Food Basics. He got fired. And I thought, man, how, you, you, don't, you don't get fired from Food Basics. Like, it's impossible. I've seen guys pick up shopping carts in rage and throw them into the parking lot. And they didn't get fired. <laughs> okay. This one guy was so mad at a customer. He picked up a shopping cart physically and threw it into the parking lot. He didn't get fired. So when I heard this guy got fired, I thought, for what? Who died? Who did he kill to get fired from this place? You know what it was? He stole a frying pan. He stole. You can't get a... Look, when it costs money for a company, see ya. If you flip out on a customer and throw some... As long as no uh, product gets damaged and no money's lost, huh, you're good to go. You cannot get away with financial shenanigans for very long until the, the master finds out. So now he's fired. And the master says, bring in your accounts. Show me on paper what you did. So <laughs> he's caught. Verse 3. Verse 3 to 7. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So what does he do? He's caught. He panics. But he comes up with a plan. Ah, he's just, this guy is a scammer, right? He knows how to scheme his way into things and supposedly out of things. He says, I'm not strong enough to dig. I can't do manual labor. I'm too proud and ashamed to beg. So I need to do something. So what does he do? He, th he thinks when I'm fired, I need to figure out a way so that when I leave this management, people outside of my master's house will receive me, will like me, and I'll have a place to stay. So he calls in the debtors one by one. They come in and he says, bring your bills. How much do you owe? Right. The first one says, I owe 100 measures of oil. He says, OK, here's what you do. Take your bill. See where it says 100? Just erase that. Put 50. OK. Oh, yeah, of course. Good. No problem. <laughs> Next guy comes in. How much do you owe? Oh, 50 measures of wheat. Or 100 measures of wheat. He says, okay, here's what you do. Erase 100, put 80. How do you like that? Oh, yeah, I like that. That's a good deal. <laughs> so they all do that um, one by one. And everyone's happy. It's a bold move, right? It's a bold move. Would it work is the question. Here's where things get shocking. Verse 8. What does the master do? The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the son... Oh, no, I'm going to end it there. Just, just there. Mark that verse. The verse is not done, but I'm just going to end there for here. For now. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. It's, Up, a, head, it's a head scratcher. It's a head scratcher. Mm -hmm. And I don't even have hair. That's probably why I lost all my hair, because I scratched it off trying to figure out what this verse meant for all these years. So, I read this... It, this is the one Bible verse, and there's a lot of strange things in the Bible, right? There's that one verse in the law that talks about don't boil a goat in its mother's milk. Well, what does that mean? It's strange, but whatever. Don't do it. <laughs> but this one, what is he saying? The master commends him for his shrewdness. 
This has tripped me up for years. I've had people over to try to figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. Now, what you would expect the master to do is to beat the manager and send them out in shame. We read other parables of Jesus where this happens. The manager or, or the, the, the master in the parable beats the, the servant and sends him away in shame. But not in this one. In this parable, the master commends the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. I've mauled this over for hours and hours and commentary after commentary. And they say things, but uh, I don't know. I just didn't, it didn't sit well with me. So the question I would ask myself is, why is the master commending the dishonest manager for his dishonesty? This was like a theological pretzel that you couldn't unwind. Not that you can unwind any pretzel, but this one was even harder. So obviously the rich man in this parable represents who? Who is the rich man in the parable representing? Jesus. Yeah, it's representing God. Who is the manager? That's the question. Now, I always thought the manager represented believers, disciples, right? Because uh, after all, the first verse says he, he said this to his disciples. But at the end of the parable, the Pharisees ridicule Jesus for the parable. So, I got it wrong the whole time. The manager doesn't represent disciples. The manager represents the Israelite establishment, the religious elitist establishment that was tasked with stewarding the riches of the Word of God. See, So, I was asking the wrong question all along. I was identifying the manager with the wrong group. So, read this verse carefully, okay? Because if you don't read it carefully, this is where you get tripped up. The master was not commending the dishonesty of the manager, okay? It says he was commending his shrewdness. This is an important distinction, okay? Let's, I, need to, I need to get into another Greek word here because it's important. The word shrewdness in Greek is phronesimos. Gosh, brutal. Phronesimos. There it is, phronesimos. <laughs> This word means acting in wisdom, practical intelligence, and prudence. So this is the same word, phronesimos, that Jesus uses in Matthew 7, 24, when he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a phronesimos man who built his house on the rock, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So then, so then it wasn't the dishonesty that was being commended. It was the shrewdness. It was the wisdom. Furthermore, the word commend means to extol, to praise, to be pleased with. So this gets even crazier. So now we see that the, 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 the master, the rich man, is praising the dishonest manager for his wisdom. What wisdom? <sighs> okay, let's break this down. We know the dishonest manager was dishonest with his master's riches, right? Okay, we got that down. And the way he was dishonest with his master's riches was in a way that led to his own personal financial gain. Okay, we got that down. Now, we know the Pharisees were likewise were being dishonest with the master's riches, which is the word of God. And they were stewarding God's word in a way that led to their own personal, not just financial gain, but social gain. You know, they were seen higher on the social hierarchy, status, and so forth. So they were... They were using God's word, the riches of God's word, to personally uh, get themselves gain in very many different areas. So the acts of, so here's what happens. The acts of cutting the debtor's bills in the parable here was not an immoral act. It was a wise and prudent act. Okay, how and why? This is how. This could only mean the manager did not actually cut the bills. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was finally accounting for the bills honestly. So, just like the Pharisees were heaping extra burdens upon the people of God that God never commanded, right? They were adding to the commandments, heaping extra burdens upon them. So, the dishonest manager was heaping extra charges upon the debtors that the master did not require. You see? This is why... Well, yeah, so 
th th this is why the master was pleased. Here's what happened. Not only did the manager gain favor with his debtors, but he was being honest. So here's here's what happened. The one who owed a hundred never owed a hundred. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He yeah. always owed fifty. Yeah. But the manager would charge a hundred, pocket the difference. You see. Mm -hmm. The other who owed a hundred always actually owed eighty. In this way, the debtors perceived, oh, I'm getting a discount. And the master was finally seeing, ah, you're being honest now. You're, you're, and you're doing it in a very shrewd way, though. But you're being honest. You're, you're, you're doing the, the right thing. Now, it was a common practice among the temple elites to do what? To mark up the cost of the animals in the temple for sacrifice. And what would they do? They pocketed the difference. This is what, why Jesus you know, flipped out in the temple and drove them out. Because what they were doing was selling uh, uh, animals and different things for religious observance. And that wasn't wrong. God commanded them to do that. He said, if you live far away from the temple, sell your sacrifice, bring the money to Jerusalem. And then when you're there, buy the sacrifice and then sacrifice. So selling the animals wasn't bad. It was actually commanded. But what was bad was they were marking it up. So that poor people could not participate in the worship of God unless they were wealthy and if so, they brought their own money wherever they came from they had to exchange exactly for the money that they'd take yes and, it, marked that up. and even the exchange was marked up so the pharisees who were listening to this parable they knew what he was saying <laughs> they understood what was happening here but us in the 21st century we read we read this and it's kind of a what's going on here but when you when you put the context in, it makes perfect sense given the situation it was truly a very wise prudent and shrewd course of action so the manager was actually repenting for his own good and the master praised him for turning from his dishonesty to to his shrewdness now if only he could have applied this wisdom before he got caught being dishonest before he was fired and here's a really interesting insight I found here. This parable is very similar to the parable of the prodigal son that we discussed last week. So here's, here's the interesting parallels here. Both end, both parables end with a derelict son or servant, right? Being received back and being commended by the father or the master. After coming up with a plan that would save their own behinds from disaster, right? Remember? So in the prodigal son story, the son wastes his inheritance. There's that theme of wasting uh, money. And then he comes back in repentance because he's about to starve and die. So he finds himself in the position where he's like, okay, either I go back and beg for a job from my father or I'm going to die here. In this story, we see the manager... He's about to be homeless and with no friends because he's been such a dishonest guy his whole life. And so he begins to account properly, gaining favor with the debtors and receiving praise from the master when all was said and done. So both the prodigal son and the dishonest manager took action to save their own skin from disaster by repenting. And both were received back by the father and by the rich man. So Jesus continues in verse 8, and if you thought things were a head-scratcher, begin to scratch, get your fingers knit ready to scratch <laughs> a little bit more here. So the, the last half of verse 8, he says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the, rich, the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So as I studied this passage for many years, trying to figure it out, I always understood the point of the passage was you can't serve God in money. That's how Jesus ends it. It's clear that's the point. I just didn't. I just couldn't figure out how he got to that point. 
He says all this stuff, and then he gives you the point. I'm thinking, okay, that's the point, but how do you get there from here? I couldn't, I couldn't bridge the gap. So this is another head scratcher, but it makes total sense when you understand what the Pharisees were doing with their religious, financial, purity uh, racket that they were running. He says, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, here's what's happening. The Pharisees are ripping people off, both with the financial assets of God and the word of God, the treasure of the word of God. In both instances, they're ripping people off. Jesus is saying this, use the unrighteous wealth Use the money, the physical money. Stop ripping people off. Stop running a dishonest racket. You can't keep doing this forever and think that God is just going to turn a blind eye as if God doesn't see what you're doing. The wealth of this world, Jesus says, will fail. The unrighteous wealth will fail. Money will fail, ultimately. But if you use it properly right now, as a tool to mutually benefit humanity and spread God's kingdom to the ends of the earth, then you will receive and be received into the eternal dwellings. If you're faithful with a little, you will be faithful with much. If you're dishonest with a little, you will be dishonest with much. If you have not, here's what Jesus is saying. If you have not been faithful with the unrighteous wealth, with the, with the money of the world, if you haven't even been faithful with that, why in the world do you think God's going to entrust you with the heavenly riches, with the true riches? See, he's making, he's making a parallel here now. He's saying, look, if you can't even be faithful with earthly riches, you think God's going to give you eternal riches? Of course not. This is the key. Jesus finishes by making it plain. You cannot serve two masters. Either you'll love the one, or you're going to hate the other. You cannot serve God in money. There's the point. There's what he was trying to communicate to them. You can't do both. Uh, often God um, refers to his relationship with us in terms of, of marriage. You can't be married to, to the Lord and to Baal. Right? You, can't serve, you can't be married to money and to the Lord. You can't serve both. You can't love both. You're going to hate one or the other. There's no two ways about it. The Pharisees and their elitist establishment were dishonest man managers. They thought they could serve God in money. And it wasn't that they, it wasn't that they made money in service to God that was the problem. Right? That, that wasn't the problem. God tells the Israelites to give to the temple their tithe to support the Levites. Right? That was their portion. The Levites' portion was 10% of the rest of the tribes. So they were tasked by the Lord to serve in the temple and make their living by serving in the temple. So making money wasn't bad. It, that wasn't the problem. The problem was they were making it in exorbitant amounts dishonestly. They were running a scam. They were heaping burdens on people that they themselves weren't keeping. Now, does that sound familiar? People heaping burdens, elite, elites heaping burdens upon the normies that they don't keep, right? Uh, who is that guy in Alberta? Kenny, right? Remember? Stay home, wear a mask. And then they take pictures of him on top of a, 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 a five-star hotel, restaurant, no mask, eating, drinking wine with all his buddies, no problem. And he gets on TV and he says, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. <laughs> while he gives fines to churches and while he, he, he locks up pastors in jail and has them, has them put behind bars and treated poorly. And so nothing has changed, folks. There are still elites who are very religious, who are heaping burdens upon people who they themselves can't keep and who are getting very rich in the process. They were profiting in a dishonest way. They were exploiting the poor, pocketing the difference. They tried to balance two masters, God and money, but the day of reckoning had come. And Jesus was ultimately calling them to repent. He was there to break the bad news. If you don't repent, he's going to pull a Donald Trump. You're fired. I can't do his voice, but you're fired. 
So how did the Pharisees respond? Verse 14. The Pharisees who were lovers of money, well, there it is, plain as day. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom is preached and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So the Bible gives us a descriptor about the Pharisees, right? Remember English class? What was the descriptor here? Lovers of money. They were lovers of money. And why does Luke include this descriptor in this passage? Because it's important for the reader to understand they're lovers of money, that this parable was directed at them. Jesus finishes the sec this section on the parable by summarizing what the point was. You can't learn, l love God and money, but the Pharisees were lovers of money. So obviously he's talking to them. Now he's talking to his disciples, but he's really talking to them. You ever see that happen in the real world? <laughs> that happens. Oh, I know who he's talking about. He's warning the disciples, essentially, <clears throat> don't be lovers of money. Like these guys. <laughs> <laughs> what does this imply? That they're not lovers of God. That their response, in their response, makes it clear. They ridiculed Jesus. When they heard the word, the parable, they ridiculed him. Now, this wasn't the traditional ridicule, right? That's like mocking and jesting and making fun. In this context, the word ridicule, and I'll spare you another Greek pronunciation. In this context, the word ridicule means to lift one nose, lift one's nose in derision. The response of the Pharisee was basically lifting their nose high in the air and saying, what do you know? What do you know? You don't know anything. We're the Pharisees. See our nose? How high in the air it goes? <laughs> you don't have the authority. We do. Who, who are you to, to speak like this about us? So they knew the parable was about them, that they loved money. They knew it, but they had to keep the show going. They had to keep the business alive. The money wasn't just going to grow on trees. He knew it, they knew it, and God knew it. They were fired. Jesus came to say, Pharisees, you're fired. You're done. The law and the prophets were until John. In the moment John began lifting his voice, saying, prepare the way of the Lord, the good news of the kingdom began. And Jesus says, everyone forces his way into it. What does that mean? Everyone forces his way into it. It means that the entrance into the kingdom of God is not for the religious elite to gatekeep. At least not anymore. This means the same thing as when Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew 21, 31. Remember when he said, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom before you. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. What he's saying here. It was over. Their authority was stripped from them. Jesus came and basically said, I heard you're wasting my father's possessions. Bring in your accounts. You're fired. I'm taking the riches of the kingdom and giving them to those who are forcing their way into it. I'm giving it to those who you've manipulated, who you've condemned. Remember, verse 1 in the string of parables says that the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus. And that's why... The Pharisees got so upset. So Jesus is saying, these people are now forcing their way into it, and you don't get in. But, even with that said, the law cannot be made void. Jesus was not saying the law of God was fired. He was saying the Pharisees who were gatekeeping it and heaping burdens upon people that the law did not require, that they were fired. But the law cannot become void. The kingdom was open to all who would repent, who would force their way in and come to the Father. So the Pharisees thought they could serve God in money, but Jesus said, sorry guys, can't do it, not how it works. There's only two options for those who love money and think they can love God too. Number one, repent, <laughs> right, and be commended for, by God for your repentance, for their wisdom, and receive the riches of the kingdom. Or two, option two is continue in their love of money and have it all stripped away from them and be barred from coming into the kingdom. You would think it's an easy choice, right? But as we see in the world, it's not. 
Now, money is not bad. Money is a, is a tool, a good tool that helps humanity to scale. Money is a tool to, that we must use to glorify God. It's a way for humans to store their most valuable assets, which is their time and their energy. That's all money is. Money is just a technology to store your time and your energy. How do you make money? You expend energy and time and are rewarded for that labor and that energy and that time with money. So money is just a tool we use to store time and energy, which is our most, most valuable asset we have. So when we use money to trade with another human for their value, their time and their energy, we're reflecting God's image because God said in the beginning, right? He said, go and take dominion, go and uh, uh, subdue the earth. That takes what? Work. That takes time. That takes energy. So when we trade our time and energy, are you following me here or am I not making sense? When you trade your time and energy in the form of money, you're reflecting God's dominion mandate. It's a good thing. Money is a tool to love our neighbors. But when you love money and not God and not your neighbor, this tool that could be used for such good turns into such evil. You, right? The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. When you love something, even a gift, and not the giver, it becomes the root of all evil. It's crazy. There's a subtle distinction, but it makes all the difference. So instead of using money to build people up, to draw people closer to God, the Pharisees used money to exclude people, to condemn people, and to enrich themselves. The Pharisees were takers. They took money. They added no value. <laughs> they just took, took, took no value. God's image dictates that we be makers, creators, add value to the world. Making money is not bad. You want to make money? Add value. Add value. God's image dictates that we add value. That's what God does, right? What does he do in the beginning? He makes the whole one first chapter of the Bible is just God making stuff, adding value. That's all he did is value, value, value. It's good. It's good. It's good. He made man. He said, wow, man, look at all this stuff I made. All this value I made for you, completely free. Go and take my value and add more value. Oh, and by the way, you're alone? Here, here's a woman. Here's someone to add even more value to your life. Go with her. And now you can make other little image bearers, other little value creators, and go and make stuff. Go and subdue this thing and make it beautiful. I made you a little garden. There's a big earth. Expand it to all the earth. That's going to take a lot of work. But it's good work. The Pharisees inverted that. They just took, 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 never added anything. The Pharisees were quite literally perverting the meaning of what it was to be made in God's image. It's not about taking money and bribes. It's not about heaping burdens that God never required. Jesus came and he paid the price for our sin. He paid the price with the most valuable currency ever. You know what it was? The blood of the Lamb. We owed God an eternal debt, and no amount of religious racketeering could pay the debt. Only one currency was accepted by the Lord for this debt. It's the blood of Christ. Not your blood, only his blood. Jesus was calling them to repent, and he's calling us to repent too. Turn from our sin, turn from our greed and our misplaced worship, and trade in your filthy rags for the perfect righteousness of Christ. And his blood money, I know that term is used negatively, but in this case, the blood money of Jesus will wipe away all your sins and make your account whole with the rich man, with the master forever. That is the most valuable payment ever made was on the cross. And there's a reason why the Bible uses financial terms to describe it. And we just sang this morning, right? That was on purpose. Jesus, what? Paid it all. He paid it. But not with money of the world, but with the blood that was flowing in his veins. He paid it all. All to him I owe. 
You can't serve God in money. But at the core of our service to God and man, we can use money to build his kingdom. Serve God and love your neighbor. But repent. That's the message. Let's pray. Thank you again, Father. You're so faithful to us. Oh, Lord, help us to um, reveal to us areas of sin in our life where we need to repent. Help us, Lord, to serve you with all we have, with our time and talent, our energy, and, of course, our money as well. Help us, Lord, to be generous. And, uh, Lord, we pray that however we use our finances, it would be um, used by you to draw people into your kingdom. Give us a right perspective on money and uh, let us not be um, closed fisted but open handed. And uh, yeah, Lord, we want to serve you. That's what we want. Just grace. More grace, Lord. We need more grace. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.